Well, hi everyone. This is Rob Piazzadari. I'm glad y'all uh, want to spend the day this afternoon with us at the Path Data Architecture Chapter. Um, I have a really great speaker today. His name is Tim. He um, volunteered to come on here and talk about Azure SQL Server Managed Instance. Um, as always, uh, if y'all have any questions, you can uh, email us, email me at Rob at SQL Tigers, or you go to the Path Data Architecture chapter and email us there so i'd first like to thank hvr for uh sponsoring our past architecture chapter and um if you don't mind you have some time check out their products you can, their web links right there and, and see what's going on also Nutanix is our one of our sponsors. They've been with us a long time now, I guess about two or three years. So thank you, Nutanix. And um, if you have time, check out their website too. They make um, these sessions possible, these two great sponsors. Past Summit's coming up. And if you'd like to go, um, go ahead and uh, use this special discount code, B-G-D-I-S-E-N-K-E. -E. It'll save 150 bucks. And uh, also, if enough people use it, I think we'll be able to give away a free session. We did that a year or two ago. Some lucky winner got to go, and it was pretty cool. So here are some of the pre-cons. You're going to see some really uh, great people speaking, like Kimberly, um, other great speakers. And uh, if you have, I mean, if you sign, it's a great thing to sign up. It's, I think it's they have two of them. You can choose one or two or both. And, you know, it it's, would be, you know, have great sessions and learn some new things. And that, that's all I have today, so I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Tim, you there? I am. Great. I'm going to see if we get your screen here. All right. Yeah, I well, see screen. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is a tour through Azure SQL Database, an introduction to Azure Managed Instance. Uh, this is a, a very full presentation, a lot of content, so we'll just jump right in. I am with SQL Skills. We're a team of world-renowned SQL Server experts. I get to hang out and work with people like Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Glenn Berry, Aaron Stellato, and Jonathan Cahayas. We do instructor-led training. We do online training through Pluralsight. We have, we've launched our, launched our own new um, online training courses. I have a slide for that coming up. Of course, we're a consulting firm, so we do consulting, remote DBA conferences like this uh, past summit, SQL Intersection we're at, and you, you can become a SQL Skills Insider by going to sqlskills.com forward slash insider. I mentioned our training. We have our uh, in-person training classes. We do those in Chicago, Bellevue, uh, we've also done those in the UK, Ireland, Australia. We have classes coming up in September in London. Uh, and like, like I mentioned, we also have uh, our online courses. So we have IE, um, planning and implementing an upgrade, a transactions, locking, blocking, isolation. You can check all those out on sqlskills.com forward slash training. I mentioned the the intersection conference. Our fall intersection is coming up in December. It's uh, December 2nd through the 8th in Las Vegas at the MGM. We'll have over 40 plus SQL Server sessions and nine workshops, so make sure to check that out. And I mentioned Pluralsight. Pluralsight is where we, I think we just had our, our 60 plus, plus course. Uh, Glenberry just finished one up um, on 2017. So lots of different courses out there. If you email paul at sqlskills.com, just put in uh, you know, user group plural site code in the subject line. He'll send you a code good for uh, 30 days of all the SQL skills content. So you really can't watch all of it if you tried you know, 40 hours a week because we have 175 plus hours of, of content out there. So make sure to take a look at that. My vanity slide, the important details here are you can email me tim at sqlskills.com. I blog on timradney.com and sqlskills.com. And if you're on Twitter, hit me up at tradney. I occasionally get out there and tweet and share you know, SQL Server information, blog posts, things like that. Uh, Twitter, there's a lot more to it than just the Kardashians or POTUS. There's an entire SQL Server community. So make sure to take advantage of, of Twitter. Uh, follow the SQL Pass hashtag, SQL Skills. 
uh, all the SQL you know, related content and you'll, your career and knowledge will of course continue to increase. So what are we, what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna talk about what is platform as a service. So there's a lot of things out there you know, as a service, you have in, uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, Well, platform as a service, this is where you'll find that Azure SQL database, Elastic Pools, Managed Instance, and you know, other things kind of fall into. We're gonna cover the benefits of platform as a service. Then we'll dive into Azure SQL database, Elastic Pools, and then SQL or Azure SQL Database Managed Instance and what is setting Managed Instance apart. So first we need to understand platform as a service. So this is your Azure Cloud Services. Standing up your SQL Server environment in here or your application allows you to focus on your applications and not have to stress over dealing with hardware. All the hardware is provided for you. You choose the services and the compute that you need. It's provisioned and you focus on growing your business. You, there's full support uh, or uh, support for full lifecycle from building, testing, deploying, managing, and updating your, your applications. So again, no longer having to stress over hardware infrastructure type type bits. Then you have auto scale. This is where you, you know, as your business grows, you can scale up. If you have uh, types of certain types of the year that your business demand increases, you can scale up during those time frames and scale back down. That's a lot more difficult to do on premises because you still have to own that infrastructure. In the Azure space, you can scale up, you pay for what you use, you scale back down, and it's a, a pretty seamless operation. There's built-in health monitoring and load balancing. You have predictable performance and pricing, so you pay as you go. So as you need the compute, you increase, you pay that uh, additional uh, compute charges or, or storage charges, and then if your business, again, uh, tapers back down, you can scale back down and save, save monies. Uh, secure and compliant for sensitive data, Compliant or security was the at the foremost thought of building this cloud solution. So you'll see as we go through the presentation, I mean, all the, the regulatory and compliance certifications that are out there, Microsoft has gone through all the hoops to make sure that their data centers are secure so you can feel confident putting your data there. And it supports geographically distributed development teams. The team I work with with managed instances on the other side of the world. We get to work in the same environment. We're looking at the same things because it's all cloud-based we all have the, the same level of access to connect in and, and play around and look. And then what sets Azure apart from some of the other uh, competitors in the space is we have a lot of pre-coded application components built in. So there's workflow, directory services, security, search, and so much more. Competitors, they can provide infrastructure, but they don't have all the built-in components and services that uh, you know, Azure that Microsoft gets to provide. I mean, your threat detection, all those types of things. So where does SQL Server fit into platform as a service? Well, Azure SQL Database, Elastic Pools, and Managed Instance are all built on Microsoft's platform as a service environment. Each product gets to take advantage of the platform as a service services and the, the associated benefits. So what are some of those? We have dynamic data masking. So dynamic, dynamic data masking, if you've been playing with SQL Server 2016 or above, this is when it was introduced on premises. It's been available in Azure SQL Database for years. But this allows you to limit sensitive data by controlling how that data appears. So if you don't want to display the full account number, you can display the last four digits. If you don't want to display uh, full email address, you can specify all X's. You can specify the first letter in the, the dot com. Um, there, there's built in masking rules and then you can specify your own. And with this, there's no physical change to the data in the database engine. It's a masking rule that's applied. When you create this masking rule, it applies to all users except for those that you exclude. So maybe you need to take things a step further. We have role level security. Role level security allows you to limit the data that appears based upon the user's rights. So let's say that you know, your particular business, you also have uh, customers that are employees and you don't want lower level employees to be able to look up employee level data. So you can set a masking rule if employee status equals one, that only certain groups, administrators or branch managers, you know, admins, whatever, can see that, that particular data. So I'm a entry level employee, I'm excluded from that group. If I query a table that has a million records, 800,000 of those are external customer, 200,000 are internal. If I do a query and you know, select star from table, I'll see 800,000 records. My boss's boss, who is an admin and excluded from that rule, queries the table, they see all 1 million records. That is huge. Previously to limit access like that, we had to get creative with different sets of views or stored procedures or duplicating data. 
Now it's just a rule set that you apply and there's no actual change to, to the data or the structure. So this works with third party you know, vendors, their applications, you create the rules and you're now masking the data in, in the application or you're limiting the result set within the, the user's identity. So really neat stuff. Now let's take it a step further. We've had transparent data encryption since SQL Server 2008. And so that gave us a level of security where we could encrypt the database, you know, the, the backups and the transaction log files at rest. And that was a really good thing for checking a box for you know, regulatory or compliance level uh, certifications or requirements, but it didn't truly provide the level of access where our data was encrypted within the, the storage engine. It just encrypted the files as they sat on disk. So if someone were to come in with a forklift, steal your storage, you'd feel safe. Um, but always encrypted introduces encrypting the data in the database. So now if you don't have the key, you don't have the encryption certificate and you query the database, you're gonna see garbage for that column that's been encrypted. So now we have true database encryption within the storage or storage engine. So you at admins, your uh, DBAs, if they don't have that certificate and they query the data, that, or that table that has encrypted data, they're not gonna see plain text data. Only those who have the encryption key, such as the, the web server, application server, um, can see the plain text data. So this is huge. And there's also uh, integration into the Azure Key Vault. So as soon as you start dealing with encryption and dealing with certificates and encryption keys, then if you lose those keys, you need to recover to another system and you don't have those keys, you have a large virtual doorstop. So dealing with key management becomes super important. And so it's great that we have the Azure Key Vault that we can integrate the always encrypted into as well as uh, transparent data encryption. So transparent data encryption, it is on by default for all Azure SQL database uh, databases. Um, that should be true when we go GA with manage instance as well. So if you need to turn it off, you can turn it off. And literally with TDE, it's checking a box or unchecking a box within the Azure portal. A, you know, further into security, we have threat detection. Now this is really cool. And I noticed that uh, the slide here, it's adjusted, I'm on a different laptop. Um, with threat detection, customers, you can uh, enroll and so you're subscribed to threat detection and what it's doing is it's allowing us to uh, detect and respond to potential threats as they are occurring so it's not just your particular environment if microsoft detects that there's some type of you know zero day or there's some type of new uh, attack against you know a, a portion of the azure services and you have assets in those services. So let's say it's something against Azure SQL database or a managed instance or firewall, you know, something. And they're detecting that uh, there's a threat. You'll get a notification that the threat has been detected. And not only will you be notified, hey, there's a potential problem, it will have information in there that will help you investigate and mitigate that threat. So it's not just, you know, hey, be aware this is happening. It's here's what you can do to uh, protect yourself to uh, basically get out of danger. We also have vulnerability assessment, which was introduced in SQL Server Management Studio 17. Something um, I forget which revision, but this is a service that provides visibility into your security state. So you run the vulnerability assessment against your database, your instance, and it will come back and give you a report of you know, what potentially you know, what potential threats are there. You know, uh, do you have you know, SA with a blank password? Do you have SA with a weak password? Are you using SA at all? Uh, do you have you know, orphaned you know, users? I mean, you know, lots and lots of things. It uh, runs us against using a knowledge base. So that knowledge base is continually you know, improved upon and things added to it. So just don't immediately freak out if you run the vulnerability assessment and you see a lot of red or, or type of issues. Some of those issues could be mitigated from other things you have in your environment. Um, this is about like running some of the other, your information security department that may be running uh, vulnerability assessments on a regular basis against servers and things. You're, hopefully you're familiar with this and this isn't a, a new type technology, but we have this specifically now for uh, SQL Server, which is awesome. And then we have uh, Azure Active Directory integration built in. So you can centrally manage the identities of database users and other Microsoft services. So if you're already using Office 365 or you, you, you have Azure Active Directory authentication already there, you can leverage it to connect to your Azure SQL databases, your managed instance. Uh, and it supports multi-factor authentication. I mentioned 
the compliance certification. So here's a short list. I went and grabbed some of the things that I thought would be kind of eye-catching or that are pretty relevant here in the United States and uh, a couple of the other you know, major areas like Spain, the UK, uh, European model cl uh, clauses, but the ISO, the HIPAA, the high tech, the PCI, Department of Defense, I mean, lots. I've included a, a link to the Azure Trust Center that lists all of them and to what level that some of these certifications, because I know with the HIPAA high tech, there's a ton of subclassifications and things constantly being tweaked there. So you'd want to go and look and see if your particular level is, is covered, and most likely it is. Um, but Microsoft is doing all the due diligence in the expense of getting these certifications so that you know they're covered, that you know all the the I's are dotted, T's are crossed, that the infrastructure is in place, your ability to isolate and lock these systems down to meet this level of compliance is there. So just moving your data doesn't mean that you're covered, you know, because you can also do silly things like exposing a SQL server to uh in the World Wide Web you know, by placing it in a DMZ or, or not being a good steward. So this just means their data centers and the controls that are available to you are there uh, so that you can, with confidence, migrate uh, your, your data assets and your applications. Data protection. When I started looking at you know, Azure SQL Database years and years ago, being the guy that's written several books on backup and recovery, that's the kind of the first place I looked at. And I was shocked to find that, hey, I can't do backups with Azure SQL Database. My backups are handled for me. <clears throat> now I'll say that with managed instance, we can do copy only level backups, but with Azure SQL Database Elastic Pools, right now you can export data, but you can't do a backup database. So your backups are handled for you, depending on your uh, retention or your retention period is based upon your tier within Azure SQL Database. So basic is seven days, standard premium, in managed instance, you can get up to 35 days. Right now in managed instance, with it being public preview, your retention is limited to seven days. That will increase to 35 at GA. So what this means is we have point in time restores. So you can go into the Azure portal, you can choose, uh, click on your database, choose restore and choose any point in time within your retention period and it will restore to a new database name. So pretty easy for us to, to uh, recover our data and uh, a lot of confidence that, you know, hey, our backups are handled for us, our full backups are daily, differentials are every couple of hours, and transaction logs are every five minutes, or less depending on the rate of data change. So this whole smart backup thing that you may have read about with SQL Server 2017, guess what? Azure SQL Database is the test bed. This is where new features are you know, kind of grown and developed and then eventually make it into a box product if it ever makes it to the box product. So uh, you have built-in high availability. <clears throat> so your storage replication, failure detection, and failover are completely automated with no human involvement. So if a disk goes bad, your data is in, you know, there's three copies of it, the whole management of failing you over, of detecting you know, corruption issues at the physical layer, uh, determining it, if the drive's bad, all of that stuff is completely automated, uh, pretty slick and, and sophisticated processes. And if there is a failover, it's Automated, you have zero data loss of any committed data. That's pretty cool. And then all of your, your routing, your connections, I mean, there's no involvement from you to point to the new storage. I mean, it's just all taken care of. <clears throat> and this is even available at the cheapest level of Azure SQL Database at a basic tier of $4.99 a month. Uh, pretty awesome stuff. And we have geo replication. So for Azure SQL Database, it's available in all tiers. This is active geo replication, which means it's a readable secondary. Your estimated recovery time is less than 30 seconds with a recovery point objective of less than five seconds. Do this in your own data center. I mean, it, you try. I mean, you, you, the, the, the rates and the, the um, recovery time objective, recovery point objective, I mean, all those, those are astronomically low numbers. Um, so this is impressive that it's just built in you check the box. I mean, you are paying for your geo-replicated copy. You can replicate to a version or a level within your tier. So if you're in standard, it can be higher or lower. Uh, same with premium, but your secondary has to be in the same tier. So standard for standard, premium for premium. But let's say my, my premium, I'm on a, um, you know, a P4. I could, my secondary replica could be a P1. I could offload all my reporting to that 
you know, secondary. So all my Power BI reports, reporting services, whatever's pointing there, I could offload all the, the read workload um, you know, for things like reporting and, and whatnot. So you can leverage that. If your secondary needs to be at a higher tier, it can be. Um, so a lot of stuff built in. And from a virtual uh, machine perspective, I mean, you can replicate your storage, your Azure virtual machines, and so much more just by clicking a button and configuring your uh, the, the assets that you need in the, the secondary region. Like for Azure SQL Database, you need a server, which is a container. You create that. You say replicate the database. You assign it to that server, and it just happens automatically for you. Uh, there's in-memory support for the premium tier for Azure SQL Database and Managed Instance, and this really cool thing called performance recommendations. So this is previously was called like auto-tuning. So this is where you get index recommendations that have potential to improve query performance. So don't even remotely think this is the missing index DMV or this is dynamic tuning advisor. This is looking at your workload and determining would this particular index improve the overall workload of the server. And it's difficult to even demo this because I have to push a workload for such a length of time for the um, performance recommendation to kick in to say, create this index. Same with the drop index recommendation. I finally, after about a month of, of testing and pushing things and trying to simulate, I have a drop index recommendation. So this is truly analyzing your workload. And so, your create index, your delete index recommendations are based there. And then if you've, hopefully everyone has experience migrating up to 2014 or above and the cardinality estimator problems that can arise for certain workloads. With 2016, we got um, the query store. So we could see which you know, regress queries and we could force plan manually. 2017 introduces the automatic plan correction. We've had that in Azure SQL database for quite a while called force plan. So you can tell it automatically force good plan and let it attempt to handle a lot of your cardinality estimator problems for you. And you can still see which plans have forced plans. So you could try to go tune and, and fix the overall issue. And then we have parameterization or parameterized query and fixed schema recommendations. So if it sees things that are going on, it can make recommendations based upon uh, your, your tables, your data types and so forth. So really, really cool stuff. I mentioned Query Store. That is got to be everybody's favorite 2016 feature. It had been available in Azure SQL Database for about a year and a half before 2016 launched. So this is that detailed historical information. So it identifies queries that are performing poorly. So it keeps a history of the, the uh, individual query, its associated plans, runtime statistics, resource consumption, so if you want to look and see what is your highest cost query based upon disk, memory, I.O., uh, which query is executed the most, which one has the highest recompile time, I mean, all of those things are captured for you that you can query directly. And Aaron Stellato, one of my awesome teammates, has a Pluralsight course, uh, Introduction to Query Store, where she digs into the, the nitty gritty on Query Store, how you can tune the settings for Query Store, how you can leverage it to pull out you know, different bits of information. Um, so you, you definitely want to take a look at that Pluralsight course. And this is a database level feature. So for Azure SQL Database, it's on by default. For your box version, your on-premises, you have to enable Query Store. And I believe for uh, managed instance, it's also going to be on by default. Um, I have to, to validate and see you know, where that is on the, the GA roadmap. All right. So that's all platform as a service, whether you're Azure SQL Database, Managed Instance, Elastic Pool, things that are available to you. So Azure SQL Database specifically covered some of this. I mean, it's your database as a service. And some people hate that phrase, but that to me is, is basically what it is. The engine's out there for you. You say, I need a database. You create a database. You can create a user for that database and you start putting data in it. You don't get to manage pretty much anything else related to you know, SQL Server because you're provisioned a database. So it's your uh, cloud relational database service. You get the same predictable performance and pricing. There's four nines of availability built in. We have these things called elastic pools, which are good for the unpredictable workloads, which we'll talk more uh, in a few slides. Again, your geo replication, restore services are there. When Azure SQL Database launched, you didn't have to have a special managed uh, management studio. You didn't have to go tweak a bunch of your tools that pointed to it. It's a data source. It acts and feels like 
you know, a regular SQL server, so all your tools, libraries, APIs continue to work. And you can scale with minimal effort, and again, all that compliance stuff is there for you. So what are some differences that we've come across from the look and feel of on-premises? Well, there's no SQL Server agent. So it doesn't exist. You can use an on-premises SQL Server agent or a SQL Server running on an Azure virtual machine or leverage some of the cloud services such as Elastic Jobs or Azure Automation. And Elastic Jobs may have just come out of preview. I need to double check and update if so. And there's no database mail. That's not hasn't been a big showstopper for a lot of clients, but the fact that you can't trigger an email notification based upon a, a certain event. So I have some clients that they monitor, they have a, a job that maybe every five minutes is running, checking a table for a certain condition, if that condition exists, email a notification. Well, you can't do that built in with you know, Azure SQL Database. You can create alert rules for certain metrics such as block by firewall, DTU consumption, memory, disk, IO, those types of things, but nothing customized. So we have to leverage either an Azure virtual machine or on-premises instance to achieve those custom things that we need. And there's no cross database query support. It's just not supported. There's this thing called Elastic Jobs, but that's been the number one showstopper for preventing someone migrating existing on-premises to Azure SQL database if they have multiple databases and those databases need to talk to each other. Event and notifications. Um, so your events, event notifications, query notifications, not supported. Again, you have the same alert rules, but there's like 15 conditions uh, and that's it. Your SQL Server Trace Profiler, that was deprecated in 2012, never was introduced into Azure SQL Database. And again, when we think about it, that's instance level. So you would be capturing things beyond just your particular database. So you know, it makes sense that it's not there. Your trace flags and anything configuring SP configure or requiring SP configure. So trace flags, again, those are instance levels, so it makes sense. And then you know, SP configure, reconfigure are not supported. We get into some of the components built in that we're used to with on-premises. So reporting services, there's you can still run reporting services on premises or an Azure virtual machine. You know, pointed to Azure SQL databases as a data source, or you need to start thinking about Power BI. Same with integration services. Azure VM or on-premises, and we have this tool called Azure Data Factory. Azure Data Factory 2.0, I think, is somewhere close to GA. I, I don't operate in that space a whole lot, uh, but things that I've been hearing about it makes it much more SSIS, and maybe uh, I want to say I've heard that there's uh, paths to convert SSIS packages to Data Factory, just like with some newer versions of the reporting services to convert SSRS to Power BI. So the tools are getting very sophisticated to help you migrate from our legacy on-premises to uh, the newer Power BI and Azure Data Factory. Now, you probably notice analysis services is missing, where well, there is Azure analysis services. Um, let's see, on-premises differences related to HADR type stuff. So log shipping, database mirroring, and availability groups, you can't replicate up to an Azure SQL database as a, a secondary. You can use Azure um, SQL Server on an Azure virtual machine, which is a great method for migrating to Azure SQL database. So we can log ship, we can database mirror, or we can extend an availability group to an Azure VM. From there, we can then migrate from the on-premises or the box version, full-blown SQL Server to Azure SQL database by exporting to a backpack or uh, whatever method that you're, you've chosen to, to migrate your data. Transactional replication is a little bit different. Azure SQL Database can be a subscriber, but not a publisher. So if you can leverage transactional replication, that is your easiest or quickest method of migrating over because you get to pre-stage. When you decide to cut over, you basically shut down the on-premises. You know, your Everything's been replicated to Azure SQL Database and you promote it to being your primary and you've now replicated or migrated to Azure SQL Database. The problem there is transactional replication requires a primary key for every table that you're replicating. And if this is a third party application, good luck. Um, they're not always designed to be transactional replication uh, friendly. So pricing, we have a couple of pricing models. DTU is what we had when it launched. And that's a bundled measure of compute, storage, and IO resources. You had a few tiers. You had your, your basic, your standard, and your premium. So basic, Extremely small workloads, basically that's what us uh, developers and 
and trainers use to just have some databases up there. I do have a, a good number of customers that have old legacy archive small databases because it's got to be two gigabytes or smaller as basic you know, databases, but it's very low compute. You get into your standard tier, that's for low, medium, and high CPU workloads. So the standard tier just recently, well, I say recently, it's been coming up almost a year, about nine months ago, they increased from 100 DTU up to 3,000 DTUs. And this is CPU heavy, not IO. You're still using standard storage. But if you had a higher CPU workload that was bumping you into the premium tier just for compute, for CPU, you know, you're paying for that you know, orders of magnitude premium storage you know, difference. So they gave us a, that wider range of DTU tier in standard. So it's great for those higher CPU workloads, but again, you're not getting that super fast storage and your premium tier, that's your medium and high CPU workloads and intense IO. So 150 DTU up to 4,000 and your premium storage, the marketing term that they use is orders of magnitude faster. And I have a SQL performance article. If you go to sqlperformance.com, just click on Tim Radney as an author, uh, a few articles ago, I did a comparison from the new and you know, widened standard tier compared to premium. And when I did a high CPU workload, I mean, I had the intersect of where it makes sense that standard tier can outperform this contrived CPU workload. But when I got to anything remotely IO intensive, it was like a, the, the, a P1 was outperforming like a, an S9 um, because of the the storage. I mean, it truly is that much faster. When Managed Instance launched for public preview, it, we also had vCore introduced for Azure SQL Database. And we have a general purpose and a business critical. So general purpose is anywhere from one to 80 vCore, business critical, one to 80. You get seven gig of RAM per uh, vCore. Premium remote storage for general purpose, local SSD for business critical. So that's the big change or the difference between the two. And also your replicas. You get one replica with no read scale with general purpose. You get three replicas, one read scale, zone redundant HA with business critical. And you have in-memory support for your business critical. Also right now, uh, this is preview. So your pricing is gonna be preview. Your premium uh, remote storage for your business or your general purpose stops at four terabytes where it's one terabyte for your business critical. The big change here is when you get to vCore pricing, it introduces the Azure hybrid benefit, which means you can transfer on-premises SQL Server license to vCore license. Previously with Azure SQL Database, if you're migrating, you're, you're also paying for the bundled SQL Server license. So here you can transfer your license and just cover the cost of the compute. So it's the first Azure SQL Database model where we can leverage on-premises SQL Server license. Your DTU pricing, I'm not gonna spend much time here. I just wanted to point out your basic five DTUs, $4.99 a month. Uh, you, your S3 and S4, that's the middle line here. You see 100 DTUs to 200. There's a one cent increase going from an S3 to S4. That's because your S4 and above are preview pricing. When this goes GA, these price, you know, expect this price to double. Same with the storage cost, because that's also uh, preview built into the increase in the uh, the S3 or S4 and above. Your premium P1 up to your P15, you do have in-memory support. It increases with, uh, or increases as you scale. You get one uh, gigabyte for a P1, two for P2, up to I think it's 14 um, gigabytes of in-memory up to the, the P15, but I would have to double check to confirm. Your vCore pricing, a single vCore, $181, um, a month with seven gig up to 24 v core 164 gig of ram at 4400 again that is preview expect those to double when it goes ga your gen 5 notice there's a gen 4 a gen 5 depending on the processor you can get up to 80 v core 440 gig of ram for 14727 a month and again that's preview pricing you get to your business critical one V core up to 24 in a, a Gen 4 pricing. Your Gen 5 gets you up to 80 V core, 440 gig at almost $40,000 a month. And I, I can't really foresee anyone running a single database at 80 V core, 440 gig at that price. Uh, but you'll see when we 
get to the elastic pools, the pricing is the same. So this pool pricing now starts making sense. So what are some tuning differences with Azure SQL Database? There's a ton of, you know, all the instance level stuff we're used to doing, such as configuring TempDB, your cost threshold for parallelism, max to rear parallelism, min, max server memory, you're optimized for ad hoc workloads, or anything requiring SP configure, reconfigure, we can't touch, we can't do. Now, there are some things you can still query sys configurations, look at these values, but you can't change them. That's because it's a database scoped configuration model, meaning we get a database, we get to use that database, we don't touch anything else. And DBCC free proc cache is not supported, but you can use the alter database scoped configuration free cache. So our, our tuning options, we're used to throwing hardware at it. In this case, it means increase your DTU or increase to a higher vCore, or you can tune workloads. So tuning workloads is really where it's at with you know, the, the whole platform as a service Azure SQL database. So when I first got started, I was taking my standard you know, go-to scripts and I use Paul's file statistics, his script, uh, how to examine IO subsystem latencies from within SQL Server. That reference sysmaster files doesn't exist with Azure SQL Database. I changed it to use sys.databases and it works just fine. Similar with his file stats over time, same change. And this is important with Azure SQL Database because all these cumulative stats since the last time SQL Server service was restarted, well, with Azure SQL Database, when when was it restarted last? When did my uh, uh, IO file stats DMV reset and start calculating difference? So am I looking at file statistics for the past year and a half, last week, last month? So capturing these things for a period of time and sticking this into a table that I can reference or having a, a monitoring tool is gonna be key for knowing what your baseline is. Similar with your weight statistics, uh, SysDM OS weight stats, you know, that contains the statistics for the container. With Azure SQL Database, we have a new DMV, SysDM DB weight stats, and that's database specific. So I took Paul's weight statistics, or please tell me where it hurts, a change from the SysDM OS weight stats to SysDM DB weight stats. So it still filters out all the benign weights and it works beautifully. And same thing with the states over, uh, our weight stats over a period of time. So I don't wanna know from the, the whole time the server's been up, but if between two and three in the afternoon when things, you know, my customers are complaining things are slow every single day, I wanna know what's happening during that time. So I wanna see that time slice. So I use the weights over a period of time. I documented all of this in a SQL performance article. Uh, the bit.ly link is, is listed. Um, Ken and Rob have this in PDF form. They'll be posting. So don't worry about trying to scribble down the, the bit.ly links. And then Glenn Berry, you know, phenomenal guy, uh, has the DMV scripts out there. If you just start typing in Google or Bing, Glenn Berry it automatically populates DMVs. Um, now has a stack of scripts for Azure SQL Database. And he worked with the product team. I got to review them uh, as well. So these provide much of the same information that we're used to with the on-premises in an Azure SQL Database perspective. But I will tell you, there are things these scripts will pull back that you can't do anything with, but it's good information to have, like what speed processor are you running and, and those types of things. And some of the system level data is exposed so we can see it just like the sys configurations. Uh, so it's good information to have, it's good information to document because what blade are you gonna be on the next time when you're having problems? Did you just drop from one level processor to another? I mean, those types of things can help you with troubleshooting. And Glenn has all that readily available in his diagnostic scripts for Azure SQL Database. So what are some use cases? For Azure SQL Database, for single use database applications, it's a great fit. So many of these web applications, uh, SaaS vendors, I had someone in one of my classes that uh, had a, a ton of Azure SQL Databases, when it went over the Elastic Pools, it was new information. And so I'll cover that more in the, the next module. But where I've really seen a big uptick in a lot of my customers is, hey, we're building a new application or we're rewriting an existing application. We want to leverage Azure SQL Database. So where previously they had two or three databases for that application, they can collapse that into a single database, either with multiple schemas or just a, a rewrite. And so they write this application to be Azure SQL Database aware. And there's been a huge uptick there. Um, a lot of applications that are just, you know, have been web-based, single application pointing to a database, 
we can lift and shift, move it to you know, Azure SQL database. They put their IIS server in the cloud. Now they're geo redundant. They're 24 by seven. They have um, you know, scale at their fingertips and it just works. So I mentioned elastic pools. So I talked about DTUs. When you get to elastic database pools, we have EDTUs. So this is elastic database trans, um, um, transaction units. So what this does is it allows us to get a, a pool of compute, a pool of DTUs that the databases within that pool can pull from. So under heavy load, a single database can consume more EDD, EDTUs to meet that demand. So this helps simplify our management if you're managing a, a larger number of um, Azure SQL databases. So it's pr uh, pricing is based on EDTU or vCore. And as I mentioned, the vCore has general purpose and business critical, and it's the same pricing as we saw for the singleton databases. Um, so yeah, this customers that I've had that have had you know, dozens of Azure SQL databases and they're kind of micromanaging, and we mentioned the elastic pool, they're like, I, I didn't know that existed or weren't familiar with it. You get to migrate them over. So we have similar pricing models in the EDTUs from basic standard premium, your basic two gig max storage per database, your standard 250 gig max per database, and your premium is 500 gig. Uh, some of the, the pricing, uh, the, the pricing I'm gonna cover in some of the slides are based on 744 hours. I've noticed that the pricing calculator now defaults to like 730 hours per month. So just be aware of the increment that this stuff is breaking things down. 744 is 31 days of the month. So you would, that would be your max that you could be expecting. Uh, 30 day month or February would be lesser. And then vCore. So general purpose, we have Gen 4, Gen 5, and business critical Gen 4 and 5. One vCore has a 100 database limit in a Gen 4. A two vCore and up, or no, two vCore is 200 database limit, four vCore and up is 500 databases. Uh, your general purpose Gen 5, two vCore, 200, four and up, you don't have a V1 and a Gen 5. Your uh, business critical Gen 4, Gen 5, two vCore is a 50 database limit, four vCore and up is a 100 database limit. Um, all right, your pricing, your EDTU pricing, this again, this is a basic pool. This is your basic tier. So you have a max EDTUs of five databases or five DTUs uh, per database, regardless of the, the size of the pool. And what you can see here is as you increase the number of EDTUs, the max storage per pool in gigabytes increases as well as the max databases and of course the cost. So your basic tier can go up to uh, 1,600 EDTUs, 156 gig storage pool max, 500 databases, and each one's going to be five DTUs. Your standard tier, now we get into things a little bit different. Your max EDTUs per database almost mirrors the, the max of the pool till we get to a higher tier. Once you hit, um, no, actually it stays the same. So it mirrors a single database can consume the entire pool in your standard. Your premium, uh, once you hit the 1500, you then cap at 1000 EDTUs per database. And you can have up to 100 databases uh, from a, a 250 and up. You get into the higher premium pools. You, you stop at 1750 for your 2000 up to 3500. Once you hit the max at the 4000 EDTU pool, four terabyte max limit, you, a single database can consume the entire pool. Now, with your standard and premium, you can go in and cap that one database can't consume more than X amount of resources. So what one of my customers was able to do is they migrated to a premium tier. They had a couple of hundred databases. And when they migrated to the higher tier, their customers were able to scale higher than what they were restricted in the singleton. So when they migrated everything over, they were saving $4,000 a month in their overall cost from the singleton price to the price of the pool. And their customers saw an improvement in performance because they were able to scale a, a, a bit higher. All right, so that got into the use cases. I mean, this for the Elastic Pool customers that have to manage larger number of databases, this is kind of the place to be because you don't have to micromanage. And like I mentioned, 
one customer as a SaaS customer was able to migrate from singleton databases to a pool, saving $48,000 a year. Um, so really cool benefit. So where did managed instance come in? At, uh, I think it was build, yeah, build in 2017, springtime frame. They announced Azure SQL Database Managed Instance, and then March 6th of this year, it went in public preview. So you can go in, you can request access, it takes a couple of days for you to be whitelisted, then you can go and create the dependencies for your VNet and so forth, um, and your, um, your route, and create a, a managed instance. It takes a couple of days for it to be provisioned, and you can start playing with it. What this does is it bridges the gap between on-premises and Azure SQL Database, because Azure SQL Database is, as you saw, it's kind of limited. There's things that we can't do that customers need, uh, especially cross database queries. So we have that with managed instance. So managed instance is built on an instance scoped programming model where uh, Azure SQL database was a database scoped. So what this does is uh, makes managed instance much more compatible with on-premises SQL server. The goal here is to have 100% surface area compatibility with on-premises SQL server. And from all of my testing, that's what I'm seeing. We have backwards compatibility to SQL Server 2008, so 2008 compat model, but you can direct migrate from SQL Server 2005 to a managed instance, and it will change your compatibility level from uh, 90 to 100 to be SQL Server 2008. So what we have here with a managed instance is the entire SQL Server instance experience. All your databases within the instance are on the same server, and we have full support for cross database queries. So all those customers that I wasn't able to migrate to Azure SQL database, but you know, the singleton database could pass the compatibility. So it really made sense other than cross database query. We now have a, a method or a, a system that we can migrate them to that's fully managed like Azure SQL database, but gives them full instance level support. And we have global temp table support. This wasn't available in Azure SQL database until managed instance came along and we now have global temp table support and SQL Server agent is built in. So again, it's an instance level thing. It's there, it works. Um, right now, the only kind of caveat is we can't stop and restart SQL Server agent. It's always running. Um, I've been told it's on the roadmap to, to get, I'm not sure it'll be there for GA or not, but we will have the ability to stop and restart SQL Server agent. Service broker support, it's there, not available in Azure SQL Database, so all that message-based communication platform, we have it. Transactional replication, Azure SQL Database can be a publisher or subscriber. So we can now migrate to an Azure SQL Database or the, the platform as a service you know, platform and be able to replicate our data back to on-premises. We have changed data capture, SQL Server auditing, CLR support, and database mail. And we also have managed instance auditing. So this is kind of an, an important thing for those in the regulated, you know, audited type environments. So it tracks database events, writes them to an audit log within your Azure subscription. So you're another storage account and you can use um, you know, different tools to go and, and scrub that data and, and search it out. So this helps maintain regulatory compliance also to gain insight into any discrepancies Problem here for you DBAs is if you're in there kind of mucking around and changing things, <clears throat> you're gonna be logged as well. So, hey, who dropped the table? Tim Radney, um, oops, you know, I'm, I'm caught. And we have database encryption in motion. So I covered all the security stuff. So your dynamic data masking, you're always encrypted, your role level security, you know, all of those things, your threat detection, we also have uh, data encryption in motion, so it's using the transport layer security to encrypt data in flight. So very, very secure. What are some of the technical specs? This also falls back into that vCore pricing, so this is where we actually get to see where it's been published, the types of processors and things that, that um, are available. So we have a general purpose tier, so that's your business applications with your typical performance uh, and high availability requirements. So there's Azure Premium Remote Storage up to eight terabytes currently in, in public preview. You, they say up to 100 databases per instance. When I've pushed back on that and asked, is that truly a limit? Can I create 101? They're like, well, yes, but we've only tested up to 100. If you'd like to test more than 100 and provide feedback, we would appreciate that. I just haven't had time to do that. Uh, so you, 
it's not a hard stop. Your V-Cores Gen 4 is 8, 16, and 24 V-Core. Your Gen 5 is 8, 16, 24, 32, and 40. <clears throat> so we don't see that up to 80 here. Um, but your your Gen 4 is a uh, Intel E5 2673 version 3 Haswell processor. So it's functioning at 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, your Gen 5 is a V4 Broadwell 2.3. Your minimum storage is 32 gig, that's built in. You can increase up to eight terabytes of premium remote storage. And that's in 32 gig chunks, and it's relatively inexpensive. Your maximum database size is four terabytes, and your IOPS, of course, they, they, they scale, they increase with your storage size. So anywhere from 500 to 7,500 IOPS per database uh, file in the general purpose tier. You have a business critical. That's for applications with a higher performance and HA requirements. So kind of what sets the difference here? It's premium local storage. And right now it's limited to one terabyte. That should increase as we go GA. Your same 100 database per instance support. Gen 4, there's not a Gen 5 available. Um, at the time I created these slides, I haven't looked um, in the past few weeks. But Gen 4, 8, 16, 24 vCore is your 2.4 gigahertz processor. 32 gig um, min up to one terabyte max and 32 gig chunks. And looking at the, the marketing term, what they how they relate and classify the storage here, they call it super fast storage. Again, it's local SSD. Um, so pricing models, you can see here your Gen 4, Gen 5, and your pricing, your storage, I mean, 32 gig included, going up to eight terabytes, $516 more a month. That would double because this is preview pricing. So even then, to have eight terabytes of remote SSD, $1,000 a month, 12 grand a year, that's pretty cheap for enterprise class storage where this is, you know, has multiple layers of redundancy back behind it as well. Um, so, so not bad. Plus, your standard, your uh, general purpose, you have a non-readable secondary. So all the storage, you have redundancy, and then you have a secondary that's available, and it has redundancy. Um, so pretty good for the pricing here. Now, looking at a a 24 V core Gen 4, if you double that, we're less than five grand a month for 24 24 V core. Uh, what was it, seven gig of RAM or so per, I mean, that's that's really not bad. All right, your uh, business critical pricing, eight vCore, uh, 56 gig of RAM, 2200 a month up to your 24 with 168 gig of RAM, uh, just under 6600 a month. Um, again, your, your storage cost increases and you can get, you can price all this stuff out and kind of, you know, play around, look at the different configurations, uh, the cost per region, because again, this is all based upon US West or US East you know, pricing. You get into the UK, other regions, uh, prices vary uh, a little bit. So I mentioned the Azure hybrid benefit. So you can convert on-premises licenses with software assurance to manage instance license. So eight standard edition license, so eight, you know, core license of standard edition gives you one managed instance general purpose. So that's eight V cores. Two enterprise give you one managed instance, which is your eight V core. Um, looking at this and thinking it through, I've asked this question when I'm teaching this you know, on premises with an audience. So how many of you are running you know, VMware or Hyper-V? And of course, every hand goes up. I'm like, okay, so let's say you have a a 20 physical core with, so that's 40 with hyper threading. How many SQL Server cores, V cores, or vCPUs are you going to allocate on that 20 physical, 40 logical ESX or Hyper V host? And most people say uh, anywhere, you know, probably you know, the average has been around some, somewhere between 40 to 60. Either they say, oh, we don't oversubscribe vCPU, and I explain that's not the end of the world if you did. Memory's a, a different issue. But on average, it's, you know, I wouldn't put more than 60 vCore or vCPU. But all right, so let's, let's think that through. We have 20 physical cores of Enterprise Edition. 
So that would be 10 general purpose. So that's 80 V core that we would get in Azure for that 20 license on premises that you've only allocated maybe up to 60 vCPU. So you're gaining 20 additional vCore in managed instance for that same license. And then you're just paying for compute. So Microsoft has been really, really fair here. And they're like, well, that's enterprise to you know, enterprise license that we're just getting general purpose. I'm like, but you understand the only difference between general purpose and business critical is a readable secondary. You know, I mean, in, in local SSD, do you have local SSD today? No. Do you have any SSD? And most of them's like, no, we have you know, EMC, Hitachi, you know, some, some storage. So when you start looking at it, I mean, even in the general purpose, it's remote SSD, you know, or pre you know, premium remote storage. You've got built-in HA. You're probably in a better place in managed instance than you were on premises. We're just you know, relying on uh, either VMware or Hyper-V built-in HA. So when you start breaking it down and looking at what you're gaining, it is is pretty awesome. I mean, they're they're being you know, extremely fair here. All right, so you can read you know a lot more about this. So what are some use cases here? You know, all of my clients said I couldn't move to Azure SQL Database because of cross database query, SQL Server Agent, Database Mail, Service Broker, any of those things that Azure SQL Database couldn't do. Managed instance is a fit. And you also get full instance support. You can make some instance level changes, such as your min max server memory, your can, uh, cost threshold for parallelism, your uh, optimize for ad hoc workloads, those things. You're, it's still instance. So you're getting the instance uh, level. So there's things you can't do that are uh, at the OS level, but you're an SA of the, the instance. So I had a customer that came to us and was looking at migrating to Azure. They just needed to get out of their data center and they went through their pricing person and they were quoted, They their on-premises was a 16 uh, vCPU, 16 gig or 64 gig of RAM. So that's what they were looking to move into Azure. And so they went through and they needed six terabytes of storage. So they were priced out a D16, 16 vCPU, 64 gig of RAM with three P40 disk they were priced at $3,348 a month. While at Gen 5, 16 V core, they got 88 gig of RAM with six terabytes of storage would be $3,637 a month. And that's doubling the preview pricing. So that was, preview was half that price. And so when I pointed out that 36 versus the 33, they're like, well, why the, the difference in the price of, uh, you know, just under $300. And I pointed out where well, you are getting 24 gig more of RAM. And so they were, we're fine with just that, oh, well, less than $300 for 24 gig more of RAM, that, that makes sense. And I pointed out, I said, yes, but with that VM, you have no built-in HA for SQL Server, you know, for the instance. And if you need a an, an AG or database mirror or log ship, you know, any type of HA solution, you got to go build that. So you you got to spin up that compute. You have to configure it. You have to support it. You also have to patch SQL Server. You have to patch the OS. In the managed instance, general purpose, you have built-in HA and it's managed. There's no SQL Server patching you have to do. There's no OS level patching you have to do. All of that is managed for you for less than $300 a month. So they're just sitting here patiently waiting, doing their proof of concept in managed instance, waiting for it to go GA so they can can flip over and uh, migrate from on-premises and be running on um, you know, a, a managed instance environment. <clears throat> so it truly can have a, a positive, you know, uh, be cheaper and you know, less expensive and you have more features. And this is also vNext. So key takeaways, I mean, SQL database cost efficient for database as a service platform. Your pools, if you're managing a lot of databases, is where you need to go. Managed Instance bridges that gap between Azure SQL Database and you know, on-premises to give us full instance level functionality. And regardless of your platform, whether Azure SQL Database, Elastic Pool, Managed Instance, you still need to uh, take care of your, your statistics and index maintenance. And I always say you also need to run CheckDB. They have an article out there about how they uh, handle data integrity. From a physical perspective, yes. Uh, but until I hear different on logical checks, I'm still advocating running CheckDB for all of my customers. 
And if you want to know more about that, feel free to email me. I have no problem going into that, but I don't have time on this session. So what I want to do is kind of break out and show you a virtual machine here. Um, and if I can remember my password, no, hopefully it's stored. So I'm connecting to tradnew.com. You know, West US, bunch of stuff, database.windows.net. So this is an Azure managed instance and I will collapse here. You can see I have AdventureWorks 2014, a backup file group sample, sales database, wide world importers. If I expand security, we can see logins, credentials, our server objects, endpoints, um, replication, our management expands. Notice some things are missing. I mean, where's our, um, Database maintenance plans, you know, they're not there. My SQL Server agent, you know, it's there. I can right click. Let me actually grab my mouse. So stop, start, restart, grayed out. If we take a look at our properties of our actual instance itself, you can see the, the name here. We're running on 2012 R2 Data Center, our product. You've managed instance, but it's a Microsoft SQL Server, uh, SQL Azure database. We're on a 24 V core, 172 gig of RAM machine. Processors, you can still go in and, and change these settings. Security failed logins, I can change it to both failed and successful. Um, under advanced, cost threshold still set to five. Max stop still set to zero. Uh, database settings, compressed backup. Is, you know, I've checked that. I think it was unchecked before, but that would only be for copy-only backups that I could do. So, I mean, it still looks and feels just like regular SQL Server, but one of the differences is if I look at properties of a database and I go to options, my compact level here is doesn't work. I can change it manually. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is under files, we have our logical name. We have a, a file stream type that's been added. But if I look at the path, this is that remote storage you know, where it's stored. And then our file names are also GUIDs. So when you go to create a database, you can't provide any file name, file location, all of that is handled for you. But you can have a database with multiple files, multiple file groups, all of that still works. Uh, you, you can see that here where I restored a database so we can back up on premises to URL restore from URL to migrate your your databases but I have multiple file groups and multiple files and these files are on different file groups so all that still works but they're still stored in remote storage you can add additional files to tempdb you can change your auto growth um, sizes I mean all of those things are uh, you know, much of the same so there's a Slight changes, I mean, a few areas that things are, are kind of different, but for the most part, it just looks and feels like regular SQL Server. Um, database mail, I use my same on-premises script that connects to my uh, Google account and sends through Gmail, and I got test notifications. I mean, all, all those things work. You can create additional operators. Um, it's, I, I strongly encourage you, if you have an Azure account with some credits, you get involved in the preview while you have inexpensive pricing. Uh, I do hope soon that we'll see a two or four vCPU option here with uh, much smaller memory footprint and stuff for those of us that teach and things that we can run this because the cheapest I can get it right now is about $800 a month. And that really burns through some, some credits pretty quick to be able to show you all uh, stuff like this. So I think I'm right up on the time um we can uh take some questions or uh hey this is rob too. yep can i can you hear, hear you i Great. can yeah so we just have a few questions we can try a few if you'd like sure so the first question is uh can ssrs be run on azure sql managed instance that is a fantastic question. Um, let's see. Right 
what did I call it? Uh, so can So I've actually got a report. And so I'm, this is a, I'm on a jump box right now. And this is uh, running reporting services. And I'm pointed to the AdventureWorks database running on this managed instance. Uh, so yes, you can run reporting services on a virtual machine that is pointed to the databases on managed instance. But you can't be running reporting services on the managed instance instance. Um, but reporting services can point to the data sources. Okay. The next question is, is there a migration to go from Azure SQL to Elastic Pools to manage instance, man, I'm sorry, manage SQL? So from Azure SQL database to move those databases into a managed instance, uh, excuse me, from Azure SQL database to an Elastic Pool, Yes, you go into your pool, you can uh, choose the databases and then we'll pull those into the Elastic Pool and then you can kick them out just as easy. From Azure SQL database or an Elastic Pool to manage instance, there's not a direct path without currently export to backpack import, but I've been told we may see something soon. So I know they're working on it because it would make it a lot easier if we could move from Azure SQL Database into Managed Instance or from Managed Instance into Azure SQL Database. Um, so I would, you know, my gut is we'll see something soon, um, but you know, right now there, there's nothing other than export to backpack or export your data, import your data. Okay. Well, the next question is, can I use Azure Managed Instance as a secondary node on a hybrid on-prem and Azure availability group? Right now, no. Uh, you, because all the HA and stuff is already built in, so they're handling all of that behind the scenes, so you can't really tap into that to join to it. But you could very easily extend an on-premises AG to an Azure virtual machine uh, to have your, your hybrid SQL Server solution. But right now, the option to from on-premises to manage instance would be using either Azure Data Sync or um, transactional replication, not AGs. OK. Oh, we so have two on, more questions. Uh, well, on the screen, we have the report where I was demoing dynamic data masking, so I could go and mask uh, these accounts. So this was a demo I did a couple of weeks ago, but this is reporting services 2017 running on an Azure VM pointed to a managed instance database. Oh, okay. All right, next question. Oh, sure, sure. Um, can a single managed SQL support more than one elastic pool if you have a large number of small infrequently used databases? Oh, great question. So can you create, I guess, in that, um, hold on, re repeat the question. Sure. Can a single managed SQL support more than one elastic pool if you have a large number of small, infrequently used databases? All right. So I'm, I'm assuming that the question means if you spin up a, um, what one, I mean, managed instance is, you know, a, a, a SQL Server instance, it's not Elastic Pool-ish. You have your vCore pricing, which looks you know like similar to the pricing for managed instance, um, where you get into the vCore for an Elastic Pool. So I'm assuming the question was, if you spin up like a larger vCore pool, can you have multiple Elastic Pools in that? And I, if that's the question, I'm not sure, but you you can have an unlimited number of elastic pools and you know databases within those we have a customer that has 30,000 azure sql databases in a, a a larger number of elastic pools that they manage um, but yeah if you had databases that were 
you know, didn't need a whole lot of resources, you want to put them in a basic pool, you can have a basic pool, you can have a standard pool, you can have a premium pool, and you can move databases within those pools as, as needed. Okay, we have one last question here. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of quick. Uh, it says no alert in job agent for managed instances. And that's what the question is. So I guess he's asking, are there alerts and job agents for a managed instance? Uh, like we have in the, uh, good question. I, I, I'll follow up on that one on email. I'll need to go into the my Azure portal. But I was okay. thinking if, it, if it's not there, it should be soon, uh, but I would, I can't say off the top of my head if I've actually looked to see if I have uh, you know, the same metric alerts that we have for Azure SQL Database in Elastic Pool. Um, I'll email you the question and uh, you can follow up later. Will that right. work? Sure. Okay, great. Well, that's all we have today, all the questions. Uh, Tim, thank you for coming on. Uh, 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 thanks, everyone, and I hope everyone has a great evening, and I look forward to our next webinar. Bye, Tim. Bye.